like to introduce our next speaker. Craig Carter is with Faskin Campbell and Godfrey, and Craig will speak about the special considerations for ground and other long-term leases, including land transfer tax and Planning Act issues. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to speak about a couple of a uh, couple of points. Uh, one under la the Land Transfer Tax Act, and uh, one under the Planning Act. Uh, one under the Land Transfer Tax Act is a fairly recent amendment which is important in long-term leasing and uh, the Planning Act is a, there's a, f um, a re reasonably recent case unreported that uh, is quite helpful that I want to tell you about. So talking about land transfer tax, uh, as you know the uh, scheme is that if you have a lease uh, over 50 years it's taxable under the Land Transfer Tax Act. The way the Land Transfer Tax Act works is there are three sort of taxing sections. Section 2 deals with registering of paper, t that if you register a paper document, you pay tax on it. 2.1, if it's an electronic document, you pay tax on it. And uh, Section 3 deals with unregistered dispositions. Those are the beneficial interest in the property being transferred and there's no registration. So that's the sort of taxing scheme. The, um, the Act taxes, in the case of paper documents and electronic documents that are registered, it taxes conveyances, defined term, and conveyances includes leases. So off the top, all leases are taxed under land transfer tax, and then there's an exemption later on. The disposition sections, uh, the unregistered disposition sections, do not specifically refer to leasing. And if you read the technical wording of, this, of the disposition section, it, it arguably doesn't apply to leases, but there is a parallel exemption for leases under 50 years. Obviously, land transfer tax expects to tax uh, unregistered uh, d dispositions that are leases, but the wording isn't, um, isn't as good as it could be. So then there's the exemption, the exemption for conveyances and an exemption for dispositions. And the exemption's important. It's uh, for leases under 50 years, and they take into account uh, renewals and extensions in deciding whether it's uh, 50 years. Now, a few years ago, they amended the Act um, because there was, it was thought that there were ways to get around the uh, land transfer tax of long-term leases. And what you would do is you would enter into consecutive leases. So you'd have one lease for 49 years. You'd have the next lease starting at the end of the 49 years and run for another 49 years. Or you would enter into an option to lease starting at that where the lease start at the end of the first 49-year period, but it would be in a separate document. And the way the Act was worded, it had to sort of be in the lease, the option to renew. Um, so the Act was amended to get around that, and what the, uh, what the government said was that it's, uh, if, it's, if it's renewals and extensions within the lease, or if it's renewals and extensions in a separate contract, or if it's renewals and extensions in a separate document, in the case of, of separate contracts or documents, if it's part of the arrangement relating to the original lease, then it's to be included in determining the 50-year time period. So they pretty effectively wiped out all those tax avoidance uh, schemes that people tried to, to use. And uh, now if it's, a f if, it's, if it's basically going to operate or, or could operate uh, for more than 50 years, you've got to pay land transfer tax. And the last point is that uh, there's some controversy as to what it is you pay land transfer tax on, what the amount is. The uh, Act says value of the consideration in the case of leases is the value of the land at the time you do your registration or the disposition. Land is defined in the Act as what we normally think of land, the fee simple interest in the land, but it's also defined as the leasehold interest in the land, or leasehold interest in land. So the question is, are you being, do you pay tax on the value of the fee simple interest in the land, or do you pay tax on the value of the lease itself? And that hasn't been resolved and is outstanding. So that's it for land transfer tax, uh, just that amendment which takes away a lot of tax avoidance stuff. Okay, the, uh, the Planning Act has a similar um, concept. It's, uh, instead of 50 years, it's 21 years. So if you enter into a lease with renewals for more than 21 years, it's deemed as if you bought the property and therefore if you're effectively subdividing the land through the lease, you're leasing part of the lands, you have to go and get a consent from the municipality. Um, or you have to lease all of the lands that, that are uh, owned by your landlord. There is, um, there is an exception in the uh, Planning Act. It's uh, Section 50 sub 9, and that's the part of the building exception which you probably know about. And that's the s exception that allows you to lease 
you know, for 50 years the top floor of an office building or have renewal lease uh, for 20 years and have renewals going for another 20 years. So as long as it's part of a building, and the section uh, actually says a use or write in part of a building for any period of years. So as long as it's part of a building, you don't have to worry about getting consents under the Planning Act. And remember, under the Planning Act, if you breach it, the, tra the transaction is void. Okay, so the problem in, in, the, in the, the wording of that ex exception is, first of all, what is part of a building? Um, and what about all those uh, ancillary rights you get when you do a lease? Rights over parking, uh, outdoor kiosks, uh, rights of access over the property, over the land itself to get to the building. And those things aren't a lease for a term of years or a use of a, an interest in land for a term of years for, for under 21 years. If you have parking rights with renewals uh, for 30, 40, 50 years, arguably that's not part of the building. It's part of the land and then you've got a breach of the Planning Act and the lease would be void. So that's been a concern uh, in the law. There are, there were two cases before the section was amended. One is the Cardinieri case in 1977 of, of uh, Ms. Jess O'Leary. It's an unreported decision and cannot be found. Um, <laughs> and surprisingly, it went to Supreme Court of Canada. It was turned down at Supreme Court of Canada. Um, but it is not, you know, it's just mentioned in a, in a later case and there's no sites for it and no way to find it. Anyway, that case dealt with uh, leasing of a first floor and, and O'Leary said that, um, and it had some, there were parking rights, and O'Leary said, and this is before the section was amended, so it was wide open as to how this could be decided. And O'Leary said, look at it, you weren't subdividing the land by giving parking rights and you're not really interfering with the, with the act. You're not really breaching the Planning Act and so, you know, it's okay. Okay, the next case, a little quickly now, Favitt uh, is, is, uh, is reported. It's 1982 Van Camp. And she, she basically said, um, Cardinari is right. And then in the next breath said, but I don't need to decide that because the lease occurred just before the whitewash in June of 1967 when all previous breaches were corrected. So it, the lease was in April 67, possession was in September. So she said that, okay, uh, it's, uh, you know, all decided on that basis. So it was really wide open as to what the law was. So they passed the statutory provision, 50 sub 9, but it wasn't clear when they passed it whether they were meaning to codify those two cases or they were meaning to say, look, at, based on this wording now, parking things do constitute a breach. So the most recent cases in 19, 1996, unreported case again, Sears Canada. Sears Canada had leases in a bunch of Toronto shopping malls. They took an assignment of them. They all had terms more than, um, 50 years, land transfer tax, reassessed them for a huge amount of money. So they went to the court to say, look, we've got leases over 21 years. They're all void under the Planning Act, so if the leases are void, I don't have to pay land transfer tax. Nice way that those two sections, those two acts come together in this, eh? Um, the court, uh, McFarland basically said no, and this is very important, said one, you're not, tr you're not, uh, there's no subdivision of land. You're not trying to get around the Planning Act. So that's one point. Secondly, if you were a, 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 a shopper walking through one of these malls, Fairview Mall, you would think that the, uh, the Sears uh, outlet was part of the mall. It's also within the skin of the mall, and therefore it's part of a building. They tried to argue that it was a separate building, the Sears site, and that there was like a, you know, a, a bead of caulking between the Sears building and the rest of the mall. But they also had parking and kiosk rights. And she said, no, that doesn't come into play because those are ancillary rights. And therefore, they don't come into play in determining whether it's part of a building or not. So that case, we're hoping to try to get reported because it's an important decision and we should clear up this area. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. Do we have uh, one question? Natalie. If Well, you got to you, sorry, can oh. you just repeat Okay, the question? so if you have a shopping center, you've got a, a tenant that has uh, shares a common wall, but there's no access from the shopping center into the uh, into that that lease like a grocery store. Do you need to get a consent for uh, the lease of that um, grocery store for more than 21 years? Is that it? Right. B based on these cases and it's the the law is um, is uh, lousy. Uh, at this point, um, based on those cases, th the intention of the bar should be not to go and get consents for these things. 
that we should be, you know, that this is part of a shopping mall. This is not the kind of things they, they, that, that should be attacked. I mean, the shopping center itself went through an approval process. And, and probably, you know, the municipalities looked at these things. So, if especially if it's sharing a part, a common wall, I think under this Sears case, you would say it's part of the skin of the shopping mall was the language that was used, and therefore would be okay. Now, obviously, if it's a freestanding building on the site, you got a you got a problem, and the parking issues I think are now gone. So I think that would be okay. And I just while I'm um, stealing more time. That section 50 sub 9 is really useful in, in for easements within a building as well. So if you, if you don't want to go and get consents for easements uh, within a building, all you do is enter an easement for a thousand years and then you can use it's the use of the building for a term of years and you can avoid going and getting a consent. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, Sorry I just got to cut it off. Um, Thanks again. <laughs> I have to be tough otherwise we can't move along. Um, our next speaker is Bram Cawson of McCarthy Tatro, and uh, Bram is going to speak about what lenders and purchasers look for in leases. Thanks. Really what, what lenders and purchasers look for in leases is the money. They want to see the money, they want to see the cash flow, and the rest of it is just really window dressing. Uh, as, Skydo dem as Skydome demonstrated, all that's really relevant is cash flow. They don't care about how much it costs to build. They don't care about how much it costs to replace. They want to know how much money are they going to get in their jeans every month. So there's, there's really two aspects to that. There's the legal review, which we can be responsible for, and there's the creditworthiness of the tenant. Because obviously, if you can have the best legal documentation in the world and uh, the tenant goes bankrupt, then it's all worth nothing. The, the American concept is, is what's called a credit lease. And a credit lease is a lease where the landlord has virtually no obligations and never has to pay any money, regardless of what happens. And if you're ever involved in a US-based financing and someone looks at our leases, they sort of blanch because they're way off what Americans view as credit leases. And um, if you look at an American credit lease and you're used to acting for tenants, you go to your mind. The key questions when you're looking at the lease are, uh, do the lease, the guarantees, the indemnities create enforceable obligations? Are they in writing? Are they signed? Are they uh, precise enough? If, if a Planning Act, Act consent is required, um, was it obtained? Because if it wasn't obtained, you know, you may have an anchor store that's expiring and, and no one really expects that. Um, what's the contractual cash flow? Is it certain? or is it subject to measurement or other adjustments? You often see uh, uh, rent expressed in a lease is so much afoot uh, without any evidence of an, an area certification. In what circumstances can it stop? Is there a general no set off provision? What happens on damage and destruction? In what circumstances can the tenant terminate? If there's a fire at the other end of the mall, can the tenant terminate? Is there a rent abatement if certain things happen in the mall? If, if the Sears goes dark, 50% of the CRU tenants can stop paying rent. Uh, purchasers and mortgagees get a little nervous about that. If the landlord defaults, can the tenant cure the default and set off the amount of curing it from rent? Another big issue uh, with mortgagees and purchasers. Second area you want to look at is, in what circumstances can the landlord be called upon to pay money? non-recoverable repairs, like structural repairs. Easy to make that exception when you're negotiating the lease. What does it really mean and what does a purchaser or a mortgagee have to deal with when it takes over? Capital tax, capital costs, tenant inducements or rent-free periods that happen in the future. You sometimes see a lease that says you got uh, three renewals and the first six months of each renewal is rent-free or we'll pay you uh, an inducement for the renewal so you can re renovate the premises. Again, that's going to be a liability of the purchaser or mortgagee. Are there caps on operating costs? Are there improperly allocated taxes? And I'm not going there. You've heard about it from Phil Sanford. I mean, the whole realty tax thing is going to be a nightmare, I think, for purchasers and mortgagees going forward, relying on old clauses. Does the proportionate share work? Are there tenants in the denominator of the fraction who don't pay on a real proportionate share basis? 
because if there are there's going to be a shortfall for the landlord which means a shortfall for the mortgagee is there a time limit on disputing operating costs uh, you always see this thing that at the end of the year uh, the landlord provides an audited statement and the tenant reviews it. Does he have six months to respond or is there no time li limit? Because if there's no time limit, and I've recently had one where we had a, uh, a tenant say, I really haven't been happy with the operating cost adjustments for the last eight years. Uh, and, we're a more, and we're a purchaser and you're sort of looking at that going, well, what are we supposed to do with that? Other things to watch for. Um, does the tenant have an option to purchase or a right of first refusal? Be amazed how many tenants sneak um, rights of first refusal in in smaller centers or smaller buildings. Are there any formal requirements when the landlord sells or mortgages? A notice to the tenant, an assumption agreement. Um, is the existing landlord released? Uh, some people have a real fetish on only being liable when they're in possession. If they don't see an automatic release when they ultimately sell, that becomes a problem to them. Do the exclusives fit? You can't do it exactly, but when you're looking at the lease and you say one guy says no, no food sales and another guy is allowed food sales, how does that work? Is there a right to relocate by the tenant to an adjacent building which maybe isn't being bought or mortgaged? I recently had one where the tenant could, on a certain amount of notice, relocate his premises to a neighboring building owned by the same landlord. We were acting for the mortgagee. We had to look at that source of cash flow and say it could disappear in a second and we'd have no control over it. If the center was recently expanded, were all the anchor tenant requirements complied with? No build areas, consents to the changes in the merchandising plans, consent to large tenants. Finally, review the correspondence file. A lot of times when, you're doing, when we're doing lease reviews, what you get is the lease in a little file. You'd be amazed at what you can find in the correspondence file complaints by tenants, habitual late payment of rent, disputes about operating costs, disputes about area of the premises, and I think the most terrifying, unsigned amendments that have sort of filtered along for five or ten years and have half been acted on and half not acted on, and no one's really sure what exactly constitutes the lease. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Terrific. Thanks very much, Brian. Our next speaker is uh, Deborah Watkins of Goodman and Carr, and Deborah will speak about different strokes for different fro folks, American tenants. I um, conducted an informal, unscientific survey of a number of American and Canadian lawyers and I asked um, for their general thoughts on those issues that presented the largest problems for Canadian landlords when they were dealing with American tenants. And I had two back-to-back -back, uh, telephone Can conversations you? that I think go right to the heart of the issue. Uh, one American lawyer... Um, De sorry, can you yeah, put better? that down? Okay. Yes, thank you. One um, American lawyer who acts for American, an American retailer that's doing business internationally said that he found that Canadian standard form leases to be strongly and overly landlord oriented. And he found Canadian landlords to be generally resistant to amendment of their forms. And he said that 90% of the American leases that he does for this particular tenant were on the tenant's paper. And although he couldn't fix a figure for um, the uh, deals that he was doing in Canada, he felt that there was a real sharp contrast in that. He found his UK um, lease negotiations more similar to his Canadian lease negotiations than to his American lease negotiations. And I sensed that he was trying to be polite and um, he was straining not to call Canadian landlords and their lawyers uptight and upright. <laughs> and my very next call was with a Canadian um, landlord's lawyer who in my experience is a dream to have on the other side of a file. He's, he's, um, he's affable and, he, and he's helpful and he does everything he should to get the deal forward. Um, and he complained to me that the colonial mentality of American tenants was driving him nuts and that he found them generally arrogant and aggressive and paranoid. And I thought those observations say it all. And, but I was wondering, maybe the reason that Canadian um, landlords and American tenants are clashing has 
nothing to do with them being pushy and us being uptight, but more maybe with um, the fact that we're all control freaks. Because American tenants certainly expressly focus on control of their business and they resist uh, directions from their landlords on issues like hours of operation, restrictions on signage, uh, radius restrictions, any kind of marketing and promotion restrictions, trade name restrictions, uh, requirements regarding who and how and when the lease premises have to be uh, renovated or redecorated. Um, they have trouble often with reporting requirements um, on landlord's forms with respect to percentage rent, if percentage rent's payable. Operating covenants are vigorously resisted, as are um, any kind of attempt to narrowly define a use clause. The, these tenants insist on the flexibility to be what they are or what they will have to become in order to be competitive in the market. And this, this holds true in spades for transfer clauses. So Americans take the view that no one knows their business the way they do and no one should be telling them how to run their business. And this, all of this runs directly counter to a landlord's efforts to unify the shopping center and to operate in a fully integrated fashion. Still on this control issue, American tenants will insist on rights to cure landlords' defaults. And I'm told that this self-help remedy is generally granted in the United States. One of our American ten tenants' uh, clients tells me that he has that kind of a provision in 95% of his American leases. And my experience is that it's resisted here in Canada, a sub, uh, most especially if it includes a set-off right. So the struggle between the landlord and the tenant in the self-help clause usually boils down to things like how much written notice the tenant has to give um, the landlord of the landlord's default, the number of notices that have to be given, a narrow definition of what a kind of default it is that uh, causes the right to cure to kick in, and to make sure that that kind of a default is only a default that actually affects the tenant's um, uh, running of its business in some material fashion. Um, a mechanism for the landlord to bona fide dispute uh, if it, that its responsibility for the alleged default. And to be sure, the set off right is the hardest issue to grapple with. Uh, another much negotiated provision is the key tenant clause. The driving principle behind the key tenant clause is that there's an economic synergy among the tenants of a shopping center where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And if that economic synergy is lost or eroded, then the tenant needs a remedy. So in their very simplest form, uh, co-tenancy clauses provide that if the anchor, for example, is not operating for a certain period of time, the tenant may itself cease to operate in its premises and it may also enjoy some sort of rent relief. Or in the alternative, the tenant can elect to continue to operate, but at some very much reduced rent. Um, the clause typically goes on to say, and if that uh, co-tenancy condition is not fulfilled within a period of time, the tenant has a termination right. So the contentious issues here um, include defining what amounts to not operating by the key tenant. And it can mean a closing by the key tenant in the whole of its lease premises, or it can mean something less. It can. Um, reference a decrease by, you know, something like 10% of the key tenant's um, square footage, or it might reference a material change in the key tenant's type of retail business. Um, also up for negotiation is the, what amounts to a remedy of the key, uh, key tenant condition. If the condition is fulfilled, excuse me, is the condition fil fulfilled if the landlord replaces the, that key tenant and what re constitutes replacement? I just have a little bit. Um, <clears throat> for example, will the replacement tenant have to be one tenant for that whole space, or would it be sufficient to have a number of tenants for that space? Probably not if the, if the, Ameri if the tenant has clout. Um, would it be adequate um, for the, the, uh, that key, the replacement for the key tenant to be um, in similar in stature and similar in trade style? And would it have to um, conduct itself in a substantially similar type of business as the key tenant? And probably the answer is yes in both of those cases. And these kinds of clauses are problematic for landlords for obvious reasons. Most importantly, they shift the entire risk to the landlord for matters that often have nothing whatever to do with the landlord or the landlord's operation of the shopping center. 
And here, one only has to think about Eaton's and um, the, uh, the havoc that might be uh, wrought on shopping centers that have uh, co-tenancy provisions in them with Eaton's, particularly if they've been badly drafted and they don't um, deal with Eaton's and their successors and assigns. Thanks, Jim. Any questions? Joe. Yeah, well, Jeb, can you just repeat the question, yes. please? Joe was saying, isn't there a problem here because um, American tenants won't them themselves give operating covenants? Yeah, it is. It, it's, a, it's a fight, and it all comes down to bargaining power. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeff Lim. Uh, and Jeff will continue to discuss the uh, Goodyear case and the future of non-disturbance and atonement. When I, <coughs> excuse me. When I first came in here this morning, I bumped into Joe Reed. Instead of, in Joe's inimitable style, instead of asking me, Jeff, how are you? How's the kids? How's life treating you? The first thing he says to me is, Jeff, are you going to be your usual outrageous self? <laughs> well, quite frankly, I was. I had this fantastically outrageous <laughs> opening to introduce you guys to the Goodyear case. That was until I heard Lisa spend her entire six minutes telling you all about the Goodyear case. I have spent the last two hours trying to figure out what can I possibly say now. But actually, the Goodyear case is a very important okay, decision. Okay, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a very important decision. It's probably worth an extra five and a half minutes. So um, let me start in on the case. First of all, it's a very complicated case. Considering the issues that it treats is generally quite basic issues. The case itself is extremely complicated. There were at least three sets of mortgagee, there were two sets of leases, and it's very difficult, especially reading it from the Court of Appeal judgment backwards, to try to figure out who's who, who's on first, and what exactly the issues are. So the first step in understanding Goodyear is to understand the facts. And the only way to understand the facts is to strip them down to their butt naked, bare minimum elements, okay? And they are as follows. Day one, Landlord meets mortgagee. Landlord likes mortgagee. More importantly, mortgagee likes the landlord, and they enter into a mortgage loan. Okay? Day two, landlord meets Goodyear. Landlord likes Goodyear. More importantly, Goodyear likes the premises. They enter into a long-term lease. Now, the mortgagee had not consented to this long-term lease that the landlord has now entered into with Goodyear. Day three, landlord defaults on mortgage. Mortgagee no longer likes the landlord. <laughs> Day four, mortgagee takes possession of the property and starts collecting rents directly from all the tenants, including Goodyear. Day five, Goodyear phones up the mortgagee and says, hey, uh, we've been paying rent to you for a little while, but hasta la vista, we're out of here. And the question then before the courts was whether or not Goodyear had the right to unilaterally terminate their lease obligations, okay? Now, <coughs> Again, it's a fascinating case, and the way I always do this, because I'm, n I'm never really up on the law, I always read the Court of Appeal decision. <laughs> I always read the Court of Appeal decision figuring, well, I can ignore the trial decision because if it was important, it was picked up at the Court of Appeal, and if it was useless, they ignored it, right? But the best way to read Goodyear, and in my materials, you have both the trial, uh, trial decision of Mr. Justice Brown, as well as uh, Madam Justice McKinley's Court of Appeal decision. Read the trial decision first, because it deals with the fundamental issues of privity of estate, privity of contract, and how the rules work. The Court of Appeal spent all of their time dealing with all the tangential issues, and there were tons of them. Um, I am going to try to distill I'm going to sort of combine both of the decisions and distill Goodyear into four easy rules, okay? If you have a prior ranking mortgagee, and if that prior ranking mortgagee either forecloses or takes possession of mortgage property, it has the right unilaterally to evict every single subordinate tenant in that building. The only exception to that generally is if the mortgagee, the prior ranking mortgagee, had actually consented to the landlord entering into all these subordinate leases. So that's rule one. Rule two, and this is the one that actually catches a lot of people by surprise, but it, which is actually based on the fundamental same set of rules. There's a flip side, sort of a dark side to rule one. For the very same reasons that the prior ranking mortgagee can evict all these subordinate tenants, 
A subordinate tenant that finds himself in a position where a prior ranking mortgagee has foreclosed or taken possession can actually terminate its lease vis-a-vis -vis the mortgagee. So uh, for the f with respect to Rule 1, that explains why tenants always want a non-disturbance agreement from the existing mortgagees. With respect to Rule 2, that's why any mortgagee always wants an attornment agreement from all of its subordinate tenants which it finds useful. And typically you find the two documents combined. They're typically non-disturbance and attornment agreements, the quid pro quo for one being the other. Now rule three, what happens if the prior ranking mortgagee takes possession, these, all these subordinate tenants could walk, but they don't walk, okay? Well, they continue to stay in possession, they continue to pay rent to the mortgagee, and what the law says is that, is that there's a new lease, a sort of a replacement lease that comes into play between the mortgagee as landlord and the subordinate tenants who could have walked but didn't walk as tenants, okay? The terms of that replacement lease are usually governed by express agreement if you can find it, implicit agreement if you can find it, and often through conduct. They'll read into the contact, conduct what the terms of that lease typically are. Rule four, what if there is no agreement? What if there's no conduct? Uh, what then governs the lease that now exists between the mortgagee as the new landlord and the tenant? Well, if there is none of the other indicia of an agreement, the courts have said it automatically becomes a year-to-year -year lease terminable on six months' notice. This is exactly, ladies and gentlemen, what Goodyear found itself in the position of being, okay? They said, geez, you know, the mortgagee took possession and, uh, geez, we've been here for a while. He's been in you know, possession. We've been paying him rent regularly, but like, don't we fit into category four? Don't we now have a year-to-year -year lease terminable on six months' notice? Um, and in fact, I don't think, they could have terminated much earlier. I don't think they realized that they had rule two when the mortgagee first came into possession. It, it dawned on them quite later that, my God, we can, this is year-to-year. -year. We can terminate, and that's exactly what they did. They. Um, phoned the mortgagee, said goodbye, cut a six, gave them six months notice, cut the uh, 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 check for the rent, and saved themselves approximately $11 million over the unexpired residue of the term. And that in itself are the four golden rules of Goodyear. As Harvey pointed out, Goodyear is, there is leave to appeal, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna go over a little bit. Uh, it's a very a cute bit. argument that Burnham Thorpe is raising it before the Supreme Court. They're saying, yeah, okay, the Court of Appeal and the trial division sort of got it right. Okay, maybe that is the law, maybe that's the way it should work, but guess what? You guys are the Supreme Court of Canada, you can change the law. You have the ability. Please change the law so that there's automatic atonement that all tenants are deemed to atone. Of course, in Burnham Thorpe's argument, it's rather cute. They don't also say, oh, by the way, I, us mortgagees should be deemed to non-disturb as well, right? So they're asking for a sort of a one-way, eat your, uh, have your cake and eat it too. And as of this morning, I had not heard, uh, Brad McClellan talked to me on Tuesday, and he said that the leave uh, motion was heard back in January. They still haven't heard from the Supreme Court. They expect to hear any minute now whether or not they're gonna be going to the Supreme Court on this. I actually think that, uh, there's a bit of a conspiracy. Nobody actually wants to tell me whether the leave was granted until after I've given my six minute speech. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Uh oh. Right. Yeah. I think it's, that's how I do it. I do it. I, that's exactly how I do it, right? You know, I bury it right into the estoppel uh, certificate. That's typically what they call them, estoppel certificates. The bottom clause is, uh, P.S. We, the tenant, hereby atorn forever to you, the mortgagee. And, and of course, then I don't build in non-disturbance. It's their estoppel certificate to me as a mortgagee, right? So that's exactly how I do it. Oh. I always lead in my estoppel certificate saying, oh yeah, that uh, reliance is an issue, but and it was dealt with specifically at the Court of Appeal, I always build into my stop certificate, you know, for a buck and good and valuable, right? Yeah, that too, that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, one other interesting point, if I could just respond to an earlier question that was raised to Lisa. Um, the comment from this side of the room was whether or not the specific assignment of lease. Um, assignment of rents uh, and lease. Yeah. Well, okay, rents and lease. It doesn't matter what you call it. Like that, that document, the extra document that everyone signs and slaps on title. Um, the Court of Appeal came up with a rather interesting argument on it. They said, well, that's a nothing, right? That is a, that's a PPSA, a torment of rent 
thing, right? So you can keep collecting rent, but um, it isn't really a transfer of the reversion. So if you otherwise walk into the Goodyear rule and you terminate the lease, what are you a torn? You got nothing to a torn, right? So it's only useful if you're going to stand off on the side and a torn rents from a distance. The moment you go into possession, and we all know the tricks for possession, you know, you fix a roof, boom, you're in possession, right? Um, as soon as you do that, you terminate the lease on the old Goodyear rule. So the specific assignment of lease argument, and the one that, that drives mortgage lawyers apoplectic, is, is probably not going to be useful. And actually, I think that's one of the arguments that's going to go to the Supreme Court, that that specific assignment of lease should mean something more than just an atonement of rents. Okay. I agree. Yes? Uh That's correct. Um, I s <laughs> I'm not sure whether or not the mortgagee, uh, well, I would suspect so, right? Yeah, they said mortgagee I would suspect so. Yeah, mortgagee in possession, uh, so the lease is year to year. Yeah, that's no, it, I think it I think is. He I think steps it into is. the shoes of the mortgagee. Yeah. I think so. Yes. I think so. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to cut it off and move on. Thank okay, you very thank much, Jeff. Thank you very much. Jeff. Our next speaker is Sheldon Diesenhaus, and Sheldon will speak uh, about operating costs, proper recoveries versus profit centers. For those of us who do this from time to time know that it's not a good idea to follow Jeffrey Lem, and I'm not sure why it happens that I am, but <laughs> we'll do what we can. Um, operating costs, recoveries, profit centers. Uh, generally, operating costs should be a recovery of expenses by the landlord. I think that's fairly clear. I think that's what most people understand. The reality is that often it is a profit center. Um, the issue, I think, is how we deal with that. How do we deal with operating costs when we're reviewing and negotiating a lease? As a tenant, we're faced, generally speaking, with a landlord standard form. What can we do to assist a, a tenant client to try to limit the open-endedness of the, um, the issue of operating costs? And the first um, issue is going to be what are, uh, the first question is going to be what are the relevant relative bargaining positions? And this comes into uh, to play in, in, in the majority of the lease negotiations, but who has the greater bargaining uh, position? Most standard lease will provide that uh, the landlord is entitled to charge the tenant and the tenant is required to reimburse the landlord for all costs of operating, maintaining, insuring, uh, repairing, replacing, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the building, the shopping center, the development. And then it will go on to say, including without limitation, and we have a list of items. So one thing to, to key on, in on is this list of, of uh, specific operating costs. But as I'll mention later on, the issue of, whether, uh, of how complete that is and the effect of actually referring or specifically mentioning um, one, uh, a, a particular cost uh, sometimes becomes important. Um, the usual practice, I think, amongst most of us is to uh, then look at this list, perhaps uh, comment on a, on a few of the items, and then provide our list of exclusions or deductions from operating costs. In the paper, there's a long list of about 50 various exclusions and deductions uh, for your consideration. Some will work, some will not work, and again, the issue is a matter of um, bargaining position and bargaining power. Um, there also is a short list. Um, of exclusions, which are somewhat more general, but I think the ones you tend to see most often and are attempted, and, and the intention with that short list, which is on page 18, is simply to key in on a couple of, of key areas, which generally speaking will not be offensive to landlords. And that's, again, a very general comment. Um, there is a, um, also a tenant's wish list, which is in the paper. It's set out through pages 10 to 12. And this is th these set out some more general, um, general comments and, general, and a general view of dealing with operating costs. As opposed to dealing with specific exclusions and inclusions, it's useful to try to put in some very general language which would provide the tenant with the ability to argue. So if you talk about reasonable costs, if you talk about costs that are properly incurred, that are actually incurred, uh, that are incurred without duplication, um, that kind of wording provides a tenant a foot in the door to argue later on if there is a cost that perhaps isn't appropriate. I'm, of course, not suggesting that a landlord would intentionally include an inappropriate cost, but it could happen. Um, so th that list on pages uh, 10 to 12 sets out some general language to use because, as I said, the long list of the 50 possible exclusions and deductions is not going to be um, favorably considered by a landlord in most cases. Um, the best case scenario from the tenant's perspective is to um, list some, a, a few specific um, inclusions to require that the operating cost is not all, inclu not all inclusive, saying it, it's all these costs including without limitation, 
a whole long list. But to say that the costs that the tenant is required to reimburse the landlord are these costs, one, two, three, four, five. You sometimes see that in the American leases, um, and sometimes it'll be very specific costs, sometimes it'll be general categories of costs. So that's another way of trying to, to, to somewhat limit um, the broad stroke that we tend to find in most leases. From a tenant's perspective, again, depending on the, the, sh the shopping center um, or the, the, the project, how large it is, um, it's useful to attempt to get an, an estimate of the operating costs from the landlord and from the tenant's perspective to try and make that even more than just an estimate because if the estimate actually goes into the lease and notwithstanding that it's, it's, uh, it's uh, stated to be an estimate, if it's way off, again, it gives the, the tenant uh, certainly an argument to suggest that, it was, that the tenant is, has relied on this and, um, and is now facing costs which are totally inappropriate. The best thing to do from a tenant's perspective is to try and get a cap. And we have seen this over the last few years. I suspect that we're going to be moving off of the caps now that the market has changed somewhat. But in smaller centers, um, you're certainly not going to see it in Yorkdale or Scarborough, but in smaller centers, um, often a, t a strong tenant is able to negotiate a cap, a specific um, stated operating cost, let's say in the first year, perhaps $1.50 a foot or uh, the lesser of $1.50 and the actual cost, and then provide for a cap on the increases from year to year so that the operating cost will increase yearly uh, by 4% or, or um, the greater of 4% or CPI or the lesser of 4% or CPI, and I'm just choosing 4% as an example. But from again, from a tenant's perspective, if you're able to um, arrive at a cap and agree on a cap, it certainly takes away a lot of the negotiating because you don't have to deal with all the lists of what's included and what isn't included. And in certain projects, um, it's, it, th that would be helpful for a landlord as well. Um, and that's to deal with the operating cost, the cost that generally speaking are within the landlord's control or somewhat within the landlord's control. You, you have a lot more difficulty doing that with realty taxes because those aren't in the landlord's control. Um, there are some specific issues to deal with when you're talking about operating costs, and these are um, often issues that um, result in profit centers as opposed to, um, to straight recoveries. The whole issue of capital costs, what is included, what isn't included, um, what's excluded. And the, the generally capital costs will be included, but they will be amortized uh, in accordance with GAAP over the useful life of the item uh, with interest. That's perf that, that makes sense, um, I think. But from a um, practical point of view, a tenant wants to ensure that the amortization is on, done on a reasonable basis, that it isn't um, um, accelerated. And I'm dealing actually with a situation where a tenant is in, this, in the last year of its term, the landlord has accelerated the, ra the amortization and the, land and the tenant is facing a much larger cost. And then the other issue which I just want to touch on is the administration fees, the 15%. Um, what should be excluded and in the paper I make reference to some of the exclusions um, from that 15% um, administration fee. And it's very important when looking at a lease from a tenant's perspective to ensure that there isn't duplication, that there isn't a 15% um, fee on the operating costs and on top of that third party management fees. Now you often see a 4% management fee and 15% and sometimes the manage management fee is snuck in. Um, so that's, that's a, um, a major area that can result in profit centers. So, so let me ask you this, what do you do when you're acting for a landlord and the landlord wants both the property management fee of 4%, 5%, whatever it happens to be, and 15% of operating costs? What's your response to the tenant who says that's inequitable? Uh, I have, I, I mean, quite frankly, I have a serious problem with that um, <laughs> philosophically. And um, very often I've, I've found that uh, I have an, a number of clients actually who, who do have in their forms and in different ways right. both costs. Um, often they're prepared to give up on them. And in fact, notwithstanding that they're in the forms, they don't charge both. Um, but from a, but from a, I, I think the answer when one has to give an answer is that the 4% um, is, uh, is a, a, um, a management fee um, for the fee of actually managing. The 15% um, covers um, other costs and I think it's hard to differentiate. I can see Joe. You can't smirk <laughs> you when you say me, this. <laughs> looking at me with this. Um, that the 15% that the um, relates to, co the 4% the, the is more likely to, to relate to um, third party costs that you would incur in any event if you had someone operating the center and the 15% will cover the, the head office expenses with, uh, for people that do have, do some work relating to the, to the center that you're not otherwise able to, um, to recover. But it is a tough uh, argument. We can take one question if there is one. Natalie? Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I, let me just repeat for the record what Natalie is saying is that when she was in-house acting for la working for a landlord, the landlord's position would be that the tenant had agreed to a certain amount uh, per square foot for additional rent, and that was inclusive of all expenses, property management, admin fee, et cetera, and that the tenant agreed to that, and the tenant ought not to nickel and dime. Yeah, and, I, and I think that, in fact, is one of the answers. And that's why we, when we talk about estimates and you talk about caps, a lot of those discussions go by the wayside because if, as a tenant, you're given a number and you're prepared to live with that number and you can quantify what your expense is going to be or going to be over a reasonable period of time, you get rid of all of this. And if a, la if a landlord is in a position that they're, that they're comfortable setting those numbers and, and, a, and agreeing to, to reasonable increases over time, and in certain circumstances, historically, a landlord should be able to determine what would be reasonable, and again, perhaps just do it for a period of time so that if there are extraordinary expenses, you can then deal with them at three, four, five years down the road so that you're not behind for too long. I think there can be a win-win. Uh, sometimes you're going to win and sometimes you're going to lose, but overall, it can average out. Thanks. Wearing a landlord hat, that's a very reasonable approach. Wearing a tenant hat, I don't buy that at all. <laughs> so, our next speaker is uh, Stephen Luff, uh, and Stephen's with the Osler Hoskin and Harcourt, and uh, he'll be speaking about letters of intent, proposals, and offers to lease. Thanks, Ariella. Um, here I am near the end of the program talking about what we start off with in lease negotiations. Uh, the very first step offers to lease, lease proposals, uh, first stroke documents. Um, traditional negotiations have one of the parties usually submitting some form of proposal offer to the other, and then uh, we're off to the races on negotiations. Um, and I guess the, the point that I'm wanting to make with dealing with letters of intent is that um, if you go that route, perhaps you can cut down on the time cost to clients of negotiating and getting to the final document. Because um, certainly my experience, I'm sure all of ours, with the usual route of offers to lease, agreements to lease, then lease, is we have two potentially very protracted sets of negotiations. So is there a way to, to cut through the lengthy negotiations first on the agreement to lease, and then once the business terms are settled in very fulsome detail, can we then go to another set of lengthy negotiations on the lease itself? Um, so my recent experience has seen some clients, both landlords and tenants, say to me, Steve, let's just cut through the, the stuff on the offer to lease, the agreement to lease, let's just go right to the lease document. So um, to do that, though, you've got to have some way of getting to the business terms. And what I've seen is non-binding term sheets, non-binding letters of intent as a way of doing that. Um, the, the key then is to ensure that your letter of intent, which you had hoped to be non-binding, doesn't suddenly all of a sudden become binding. Because there's case law out there which will hang you with that. Uh, there's a case I've referenced in the paper, uh, Dolphin Transport, where um, it was a couple years ago, um, the parties entered into a letter of intent, it was expressed to be a letter of intent, but because the letter of intent didn't have the sufficient word saying it, it wasn't to be binding, the courts looked to the, um, the tried and true five essential elements of what constitutes an agreement to lease, what can make uh, something less than a lease document a binding agreement between the parties for the leasing relationship and said, I'm sorry, uh, you may have thought this was a letter of intent, but it's binding, you're stuck, that's the deal. So the key then, if you're going to go the route of not having a binding agreement to lease in place, is to make sure the right, as we all call them weasel words, are in the letter of intent. So it's a pretty simple thing to do. You just have to have the expression that this is only to be, uh, this is an expression of our intentions, it's not to create legally binding obligations between us. Now, um, if you have that, then, then you should be there. Um, I have seen some other letters of intent where some other weasel words are added, such as um, neither the expenditure of monies uh, nor the performance of uh, any obligations will get us to the, to the point of part performance or a binding uh, agreement between us. So. Um, the key then is to have those words in the document. The, the benefit I see of going to the, the term sheet letter of intent approach is that you can uh, 
address the really significant business issues uh, up front quickly without spending the great deal of time we all can do negotiating the, the, the full provisions of the agreement to lease because uh, what usually happens is those full provisions then get carried over uh, into the lease without much uh, a change to them. The argument being that, well, we already negotiated that in the agreement to lease, there's no room left to negotiate anything further taking that specific provision over to the lease document. So that is an approach that um, I've seen being used a little bit more. Um, the, the, uh, the other uh, side of the letter of intent agreement to lease coin is the agreement to lease itself. If you're going to the binding agreement, keep in mind that there's continues to be case law as there has been for years and years, and I, in the paper I've given to you, there's the, the most recent cases where courts are interpreting some documents less than a lease as being an a binding agreement. Um, the cases have for years said that if you have the five essential elements, these are in the paper, premises, parties, term, rent, and other significant issues, if those are there in agreement, we're going to find, even if you say you're going to go to a lease and you somehow can't manage to negotiate it. Uh, if those five essential elements are there, then we're going to find that there's a binding agreement. Um, the most recent case, Sadie Marinius and Hong Kong Bank from last year, uh, picks that point up expressly and finds that the parties were on, uh, on, the, uh, on the hook for that deal. Um, keep in mind also that the courts have found in the past and continue to find that you don't have to have just one document to constitute an agreement to lease. Uh, it's good enough to have an exchange of correspondence, letters. If there's enough in writing with those essential elements, the parties uh, can be found to have reached agreement, then the exchange of correspondence can be enough. Um, so nothing terribly new in the recent case law on that point. Um, I just commend these cases to you to, to keep those uh, elements in mind and to consider that in respect of letters of intent, um, what you want to then put yourself in a position of achieving is not being found by a court to have reached a binding agreement when you just wanted to have uh, um, provisions that were still subject to negotiation. So the, the, the conclusion that, I, that I've come to is that Parties seem to be going more um, to uh, term sheets before they get into the actual lease negotiations. Having said that, I'm also involved in all sorts of negotiations where we go the traditional route of the agreement to lease and the lease. But there are seem to be there seem to be developing a uh, um, a little bit more of a, uh, a tendency towards going with a, a quicker one-step negotiation right to the lease. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Thanks very much. Our next speaker is uh, Caroline Thomas of Osler Hoskin Harcourt as well, um, and she will speak about environmental obligations, what happens when the lease is silent. Well, we've come a long way in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, much, not much thought was given to environmental issues uh, in the mid 80s and um, you know that's changed a lot. Most leases now have fairly sophisticated provisions dealing with environmental issues and even in leases like a space which seems pretty innocuous like a shopping center or an office building there will be environmental provisions. What I'm going to talk to you about today is an issue that frequently comes up is what happens when the lease doesn't deal with environmental issues. Um, you know, we have a lease that's 10 or 20 years old, the tenant's been there for a long time, what happens? There are a couple of places that you can look to for assistance, and one of them is in the provisions of the lease itself. You can look for repair provisions, um, what are the obligations at the end of the term to restore the premises, um, is there an obligation to indemnify the landlord? Um, you can also look at legislation, um, the Environmental Protection Act is, uh, a very useful uh, guideline. Um, as well, I would recommend to you the uh, guideline for use in contaminated sites in Ontario is um, very helpful um, for uh, determining what's an appropriate standard of cleanup. There are statutes particular to kinds of uses tenants make, like the uh, Gasoline Handling Act. Um, uh, third place to look is tort law. 
um, nuisance, waste, negligence. Um, so you can look at that too. What I'm going to do today is talk quickly about two cases, um, one which is kind of the high water mark for landlords and another which is really a tenant's case. Um, and then talk to you briefly about um, a list of uh, factors that we've identified that go into a court's decision about who's going to do what at the end of a lease. As you will expect, because the area is so new, there's a lot of inconsistency in the law, and because of the nature of the issues, um, every, all the cases are basically uh, decisions made on their facts, and on a different set of facts, maybe the analysis doesn't make sense. The first case, and maybe you're familiar with it, is um, out of Alberta. It's Darmac Credit Corp versus Great Western Containers. And in this case, you had a piece of farmland which was leased to a company that um, uh, refurnished uh, barrels that had stored chemicals and oils. Naturally, the barrels leaked, the land got contaminated. At the end of the term, the tenant didn't want to clean up, um, and the landlord was uh, quite concerned, um, did, its, did an environmental audit, cleaned up and sued the tenant for the cost. What the lease said was, is that if requested by the landlord, the tenant would clean up to the physical condition existing at the commencement of the lease. What the court said, and if you're sleeping, this is gonna wake you up. In today's commercial world, unless a lease provides otherwise, it is implied within a lease that lands are to be returned uncontaminated it gets better. Contaminated lands are not saleable lands. Perhaps when this particular lease was entered, environmental concerns were minimal, but they are very prominent in recent years. Although environmental damage was not directly addressed when the lease was entered, the tenants are responsible for any contamination they cause. It strikes fear into the heart of a tenant. Two very important factors in the decision are, firstly, the wording of the lease, and secondly, this was a tenant who had a record of avoiding environmental responsibilities. So that's one end of the spectrum. Um, the second case is a January decision in this year of the Manitoba court. It's called West Fair Foods and Domo Gasoline. And this is a gas bar lease. The tenant operated a gas bar for about 20 years at a mall and um, the lease came, the lease terminated, the tenant was leaving, it knew there was contamination, it took steps. It got an audit, um, it, it consulted with the Manitoba Ministry of the Environment, it cleaned up and then it reported to the landlord. The, the tenant cleaned up to something that's called level three in Manitoba, which is the level which is appropriate for commercial uses. The landlord said, that's not good enough, I want my property clean. What the lease said in this case was that the tenant had to remove the gasoline dispensing equipment and restore the surface of the land, but it did not say anything about the subsurface of the land. What the court said was, in the case of a commercial gas retail operation, the landlord must know of the likelihood of contamination. And in fact, this was a landlord who operated gas bars itself, so it wasn't like it didn't know. So, and um, the, the court went on and said, where the landlord benefits financially from the terms of the lease, in this case, the landlord got a share of the profits, so the sales of, of gasoline. Upon termination of the lease, the landlord should not, or the tenant should not, in the absence of a specific provision to the contrary, be required to restore the land to its original condition. It is sufficient if the tenant restores the site to a condition which meets appropriate and reasonable standards of cleanup. In this case, it was the level three gut. So this is, in fact, a very helpful decision for tenants because what it does is it brings in um, a sense of what makes commercial sense um, for the particular property. The court found that the highest and best use of the property was as a shopping center and, um, and then sort of made the decision sort of fit within that Mark, now that makes, that makes a lot of sense, and, and um, what I think you need to keep in mind is this case has been appealed to the Manitoba Court of Appeal, and what the Court of Appeal has to say about it will be uh, very telling. The back of the paper, there's a list of um, 
factors that we've developed, the things to consider um, when you're looking at this situation. These are things that we've drawn from the case law. I think you will find the, the use, uh, sorry, the list useful. And then finally, in the situation, you might want to consider a remediation agreement because it just closes the loop on the issue. Carolyn, can I, can I just ask you, um, uh, your paper addresses many specific issues, but in a general discussion, uh, in reviewing landlord lease forms, you, you see no mention of environmental issues and just that the tenant will comply with all laws. Mm -hmm. And then you see situations where the tenant is to comply with all environmental laws and it will mention removal of hazardous substances, et cetera. And then there are leases where it goes on for five pages to talk about environmental issues. What is your recommendation from a landlord's perspective as to how a lease should be drafted to deal with those issues? Well, I think it very much depends on the uh, type of site that you're talking about and the uses of the tenant. Um, the courts look at what the, the landlord's knowledge level is and the landlord's consent. If a landlord knowingly rents a premises to um, a risky user, I think the landlord has a higher obligation and needs to draft its lease a lot more carefully. Now, that can be overkill, but I think that um, you, know, you sort of need to govern it to the situation that you have before you. Right. Thank you. Any questions? One question. Yes. Could you just repeat the question, please? Um, the question is about whether or not um, uh, the fact that is the landlord's position changed by the fact that the, the tent, the landlord has knowledge um, of the use, um, and is the court trying to put a, a burden on landlords to become aware? I, I think what the courts are saying is you can't turn a blind eye, and um, keep in mind that if you're making an argument under the tort of waste, that consent is a defense, and if you have knowledge, then you can be implied to have consented. So I, I mean, I think that you have to be very careful. Sorry. I, I Sorry, I, I'm just going to have to cut you off because we're running late. So if you want to address it uh, specifically afterwards, that'd be great. Okay, uh, our next speaker is uh, Monty Warsh, and uh, Monty's with Minden Gross, Grafstein and Greenstein, and he'll be speaking about landlord remedies, common and uncommon. I just got real nervous, Sarah about the mistake. I'm supposed to be talking about the Goodyear case. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Um, <coughs> I think I can make up uh, for some time here because uh, Harvey Haber already mentioned that uh, the distress remedy is out the window. And uh, Ken Beeler's going to be talking about remedies as well. I don't want to steal his thunder. So I think I can make up for some ta lost time uh, by being a little more brief. Uh, I want to take an opportunity to, to digress for a moment, though, because I heard Deborah Watkins make the comment that uh, uh, the feeling of some U.S. councils that Canadian uh, leases are a little bit more uh, burdensome on tenants than U.S. I just spent uh, the last two days negotiating a U.S. lease with a U.S. lawyer, and I had to fight for about an hour on two points. One of them was that I wanted the opportunity to seek relief from forfeiture in the event that the lease was terminated. And uh, he was trying to convince me as to why I have to waive my rights to seek any sort of remedy in the event that the lease is terminated. And the second one, which I think I've seen in almost every U.S. lease that I've read, is that if the shopping center is expanded or an anchor tenant is added to the center, your rent goes up by some 10 or 15 percent. And I don't think I've seen that yet in a Canadian lease. So as for those comments, I think we can uh, rebut them just a bit. Um, well, I want to give you a typical scenario, one in which I'm uh, told quite often, usually in a down economy or when uh, things are starting to slide, uh, but the thing that I usually hear is a frantic phone call comes through, so-and-so is not paying rent, sue him. That's what I want you to do right now. Don't even waste any time. And um, when you delve into it a little bit, the typical scenario, of course, is you're dealing with a shell company. And when you're dealing with a shell company and there's no guarantees and you weren't consulted in advance to ensure that there was appropriate security, what do you do? You're, you're fixed with this scenario. And I think if you're going to advise your client properly, uh, 
first of all, you're going to have to calm down the situation and you're going to have to ha think about two themes. I want to leave you with two themes that are important in this talk if I have five and a half minutes to do it. The first one is more often than not, you want to avoid court or you don't want to go to court first, certainly in that scenario, in most scenarios that I'm going to be mentioning. Um, and secondly, if you go to court, if, if you've got no choice, then what you want to do is you want to get the tenant's attention. You want to make the tenant or its per principals feel like they have something to lose. If not, you generally don't have an audience and they don't care and you get your default judgment and you've just wasted more money. So with deference to my litigation partners, um, I try to avoid litigation in these, in these uh, situations at all cost. And certainly, if I'm going to go there, then there's going to be a reason for the tenant to take notice that we're going there. Now, um, the first thing I can advise in this scenario that I've given, the shell company, tenant hasn't paid rent, try to negotiate a solution. It's amazing to me. I've had situations where the landlord and tenant have absolutely no rapport whatsoever. So that when you're told to go sue them and you pick up the phone, you say, what's happening? There's a logical explanation why rent wasn't being paid. And you just, you know, I had a few cases like that where I called up, I found out there's a small problem, settled it, get the money in, and the bill reflects that appropriately because they, they wanted me to sue. I would have spent a fortune. So, <laughs> so don't discount that possibility. Negotiation is always the best way to start even if you're going to get something less, even if you're going to do a compromise, it may end up being much less expensive in the long run. Also, if you're about to go down that route, make sure the default was set up properly. Because if you're going to jump in there and either distrain or terminate or choose one of the self-help remedies, which I talk about in my outline, the thing you want to do is make sure the tenant hasn't done anything, uh, the landlord hasn't done anything in the interim to upset that uh, process. So for instance, I had situations where the tenant sent out a default, the landlord sent out a default letter, um, say a month or two ago, and collected part payments along the way. Don't really tell you about that until, of course, you ask for the file. And then ultimately, there's frustration that sets in, and then they say, go get them. Well, if you're going to collect rent and, uh, and in, in part payments, even though I think your lease says you're entitled to do that without prejudice, I'm a little loath to go forward with the self-help remedy without trying to set the record straight as to why now the situation is changing. And if you don't pay now, all of the indulgences given to that date are out the window. So you want to set up the default properly and don't necessarily rely on what your client is telling you that you're ready to go. Satisfy yourself because that's not usually accurate. The next thing you want to do is you want to ask questions. I usually don't know which self-help remedy I'm going to use when I start off a file. I have to find out more about what the client really wants to know which remedy is most appropriate. So for instance, if the client's main concern is control of the premises, maybe there is reason to believe that there's a, a bankruptcy on the verge of bankruptcy and then perhaps the trustee of the tenant will assume control of the premises. That may be paramount to the landlord. Well, if that's the case, then maybe termination is the way to go. There may be other circumstances where there's value in the property and some of the goods in the property. So the remedy of distress in that situation may come in handy because if there's a hefty arrears, that is one way at least, if done properly and if uh, uh, we don't have all these other pitfalls, to work down the rental arrear. So maybe that's paramount. Maybe some combination of the two is paramount. In other words, maybe you're dealing with a restaurant and that restaurant has valuable equipment and also you've got a tenant in the wings to take over that restaurant. Wow, that's fast. Um, the, uh, the benefit there might be to first distrain and then with the arrears left over terminate and get the best of both worlds. You can't do it the other way around. You cannot uh, terminate and then distrain because the landlord-tenant relationship is over. Uh, some final comments I want to get to. If you end up going to court for whatever the reason, take notice of section 48 and 50 of the Landlord and Tenant Act. Most people don't know about those sections, and if a tenant is in arrears before they leave the premises, you can send out your first letter putting the tenant on notice and its principles, and I address it to the principles, I underline their name, I send it by rush courier, because I want them to take notice there's potential of personal liability if there's rental arrears. And also, if you're going to go the whole way with litigation, there is some other ways in which you can get at principles. Tort of, uh, tort of inducing breach of contract is one. And in my office the other day, we had a Thursday luncheon, and one of our litigators was talking about the oppression remedy. I often don't think about the oppression remedy in the landlord and tenant sector. 
However, if you go the whole way and you find out that the principals of the company have, uh, have uh, dealt with it, the assets in such a way so as to defeat the claim of the landlord, then a landlord is a creditor. And for purposes of the oppression remedy, whose onus I think is less than in other remedies, you can then perhaps get the uh, assets back from the principals that they uh, directed uh, to, another, uh, to another creditor. Okay. Monty, let me ask you a quick question. What's your advice in the circumstances where you've got like a Mexican standoff? Tenant is trying to pull a midnight move. Uh, the landlord security um, per personnel is there saying, oh, wait, you can't do that. Tenant says, just watch me. And they're sort of uh, pulling the couch back and forth. What do you do? Uh, I've actually had uh, these, these kinds of scenarios before. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in most cases, when, uh, when we terminate and we don't want the tenant to get back in, because we usually do it when the tenant isn't there, as an example, we usually post a security guard, um, and there have been altercations, even police have come by, and they usually don't in intervene in a civil dispute. Uh, but uh, I believe that since the tenant hasn't paid rent in the first place, there's likely the uh, possibility they don't have money to apply for a relief from forfeiture application. So obviously having security guards in place is, uh, I think, very important if you perceive that the tenant may uh, try to get back into the premises. In the scenario that Ariella has mentioned, um, it can get a little bit messy um, because more often than not, the, uh, the uh, officials, uh, police, they don't really want to intervene. And physical possession of the premises, and most times, tend to, tends to rule the day. Um, so I certainly don't want to ha go to court and try to get the person out by obtaining an order, because that's going to cost me even more money. And if I've let the tenant uh, uh, build up in arrears, I'm, I'm, in that case, I'm usually having to defend them with money that I've left there, because I haven't sought the, uh, uh, the arrears quick enough. So uh, those situations, I think you have to play out as you see them and, uh, and either end up in court if you have to go there or else certainly try to control the premises by virtue of the security guards or some other form of security. Big security guards. <laughs> okay. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Joe Reed of Hudson's <coughs> Bay Company. And uh, Joe will speak about BOMA method of measurement of space, what to watch out for from the landlord's perspective and the tenant's perspective. <laughs> uh, good morning. It's almost afternoon. In the six minutes allotted, I will try to give you an overview of the uh, BOMA method of measuring floor area in office buildings. <clears throat> As the mail carrier said about the nasty dog in my neighborhood, give that dog your foot three times and he will give you his yard. Uh, whether you're measuring feet, yards, or meters, you need a basic understanding of what the BOMA standard's all about. With the size of the BOMA organization, it's no wonder that BOMA has uh, gained almost unanimous acceptance for measuring office space in North America. BOMA stands for Building Owners Managers Association, and it's not only for the purpose of setting a common standard, but also for the purpose of benefiting its members at large that this association has come up with a system of measurement which has been in place in various forms since the year 1915. A very significant change was made in the BOMA standard in 1996. Before then, the BOMA standard isolated two key measurements, one being the tenant's usable area and the other being the tenant's rentable area for its office space. The usable area of a tenant was and still is simply a measurement of the space available for its sole use to the exclusion of others. The rentable area, as defined up to 1996, was a calculation made for the purposes of allocating to that tenant its proportionate share of the common elements situated on that tenant's floor, such as the washrooms, janitorial mechanical rooms serving that floor, common corridors for that floor, and the elevator lobby on that floor. This grossed up number was then used for the purposes of determining, most importantly, the tenant's basic rent and for allocating the tenant's proportionate share of operating costs for that building. Uh, many pre-1996 office leases uh, simply dealt with these two components by putting in two definitions, one for a multi-tenant floor, uh, being a calculation which took the tenant's usable area and grossed it up to allow for those uh, common areas on the floor, and for a single tenant floor, what they basically did was they said, your lease encompasses or your space encompasses the whole of that floor less certain vertical penetrations on that floor such as stairwells and elevator shafts. In 1996 though, BOMA decided that by changing the BOMA standard, 
the total rentable area for that building could be increased. And they did it in the following basis. They broke down the building into three basic components, the first being the usable area that I just spoke of, the second being the common areas which serve tenants on that specific floor, which they now call floor common areas, and the third and most important component is what is called the building common area. A new definition, namely the basic rentable area, uh, then was used to replace the old definition of rentable area, um, such that basic rentable area now is uh, the usable area grossed up to encompass the common areas found on that particular floor that are used by tenants on that floor. I trust I haven't lost you in this brief analysis, uh, but I do want to emphasize upon you the fact that uh, BOMA has for its benefit kept the term rentable area as part of its standard, but has made a very significant change in the method of measuring rentable area. In other words, the new definition of rentable area now gives you a larger area on which to pay rent. Let me explain what building common area is. Uh, this new definition is intended to catch those components of the building uh, which are provided for all of the tenants in that building, i.e. Uh, they, they are available for use of all of those tenants. Some of the examples are the main lobby, uh, security desks for that building, concierge facilities, vending areas, mail rooms, daycare facilities, and the various and sundry mechanical rooms which serve the whole of that building. Specifically excluded, at this time anyway, are the parking facilities. To further confuse matters, in calculating the rentable area for the building common area, one must, um, must gross up that building common area. Now, this really gets confusing uh, and, and somewhat complicated. Um, so now you have two grossed up numbers. You've got the usable area for a tenant being grossed up, and you've got the building common area being grossed up. These two grossed up numbers are then uh, used in, a, a, in various and sundry formulas to give you the building rentable area and a tenant's rentable area. It's also necessary, necessary to gross up that building common area uh, so as to give consistent measurements from floor to floor, including the main floor for that office building. BOMA puts out a fairly detailed manual, it's about 30 or 40 pages dealing with the BOMA standard, and I would suggest that it would be worthwhile for you to obtain a copy from their Toronto office at a cost of $50 plus GST. Um, even after looking at that manual, you'll find that it leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Another way of simplifying the situation post-1996 is to say that before 1996, we basically had what is called floor common areas, and now we have floor common areas and building common areas. Um, in speaking to people in the industry and to uh, senior officials with BOMA, uh, it is found that there's great reluctance to apply these new standards, especially to existing tenants, and they are hoping that they will be able to uh, bring in the new standards as leases roll over and as new leases are entered into. But what I suspect will happen is, if tenants are aware of the situation, they will simply try to reduce the per square foot rent so that the global rent is going to be the same. Uh, please read my paper. I, I raise a number of concerns uh, that should be looked at by both landlords and tenants. But before I finish, I want to point out one mistake in my paper. If you turn to page three, uh, just before the two uh, equations in the center there, the sentence starting a tenant's rentable area uh, is calculated by taking the tenant's rent, uh, basic rentable area, change basic rentable area to usable area. And that will make a little more sense. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Uh, it, it's actually been my experience that uh, landlords, office building landlords, are moving more and more to the 1996 formula. Have you had any exposure to that? Well, in many cases, they have the right to do so, uh, even with existing tenants. Uh, but I, there, I'm, I'm finding there's tremendous reluctance and to, to do also, so. There's also the difficulty, the issue you pointed out, where they're not changing existing tenants and just changing new tenants, and then you've got like different formulas for proportional Well, that's share. the other problem. In some cases, there are shortfalls. In some cases, there's duplication and, and, and profit centers for landlords, and it's all getting quite complicated. And BOMA has done this simply so they can um, get a little more rent for their, uh, their owners. Thank you.
Our next uh, speaker is uh, Devin Jones of Oxford Properties Group. And uh, Devin will speak about Y2K lease issues, separating the hype from the reality. With another mass exodus, Joe, don't feel bad. <laughs> Y2K, is it a lot of hype for a tempest in a teapot? In my view, in North America, at least, Y2K will likely be a non-event. More and more, we're hearing less guarded answers that all will be well. The City of Toronto's slogan is business as usual. The Canadian Bankers Association issued a virtual guarantee that money and account information will be safe in Canadian banks. Bell has said that even if there are problems with the systems, at least the payphones will work. <laughs> I think these assurances couldn't have been given, though, if companies and others hadn't spent the last couple of years inventorying, inquiring, replacing, testing, and formulating contingency plans. Although I'd be very surprised by cataclysmic events as a result of Y2K breakdown, there's certainly the possibility of such things as power interruptions around the change of the century. Ontario Hydro has told us that they're more than able to meet the requirements of the province, that they produce something like 23 kilobytes or whatever it's called, and our actual requirements are only 22, or it's 26 and 22. We had 22 the other day, which just happened to make me think of that. It's close. Anyway, notwithstanding that, I think Hydro has uh, treaty obligations to the North American grid, and even if they can supply the province, they may not be able to completely ignore the obligations that they have to the rest of the country or the, pro the continent. So the answer may not be as simple as it appears on the surface. The other obvious problem, which I won't address really other than to mention it, is what the police call the risk of abnormal human behavior on that night. Well, let's look at the least related issues. In the material provided, I suggested what I see as the main issues in a commercial leasing context. Both the landlord and the tenant will be concerned that the other is Y2K compliant. For the landlord, that's really a covenant issue. Will the tenant be able to continue operating it, its business and pay its rent? For the tenant, the question is whether it's, the premises will be open for business on the first business day of the new year. January 4th for offices, January 2nd for retailers, and for those who have 24 and 7 shifts or industrial buildings, perhaps somewhere in between or they'll be operating right through. It would appear then that the industrial or 24 and 7 tenants would be at the greatest risk. There'll probably be time to apply patches if things are found to be deficient in the office or in the retail sectors. But if you look at the magnitude of your client's risk by considering the class of building that they occupy, you'll find that the highest risk will probably be for those tenants in sophisticated downtown core buildings <coughs> or other kinds of buildings that are designed to be run solely by computerized systems. And it would likely be lowest for the tenants in industrial buildings, which tend only to have mechanical equipment, which is not Y2K reliant, or affected, sorry. Even shopping centers are relatively uh, simple buildings. I've been told one of the few recurringly non-compliant pieces of equipment in Canadian shopping centers is traffic counters. Obviously important to business, but not crucial to business as usual. But by looking at the risk your, uh, to your client from the perspective of when they need to open for business and what class of building they occupy, you see there may not really be a problem, barring events outside the control of the landlord. The landlord and the tenant can ask each other for written assurances, whether that's a lease clause in a new relationship or a survey response in an existing relationship. I think I can assure you that neither party will be happy with the response that they get from the other one. Nobody's willing to guarantee a building will be 100% up and running or that a business will be fully functioning on the first business day of the new year. Any assurance that you get will be qualified highly by references to those matters over which a party has no control, such as utility suppliers or other third party suppliers. Probably the most sensible thing is to seek verbal assurances to find out where your landlord or your tenants, your key tenants uh, Y2K program is. That's probably where the most practical level of comfort is going to come from. Another issue is the passing through of Y2K compliance costs as an operating cost pursuant to the lease. As I understand it, the CICA rule is that these costs are merely maintenance costs. That is a cost which permits the owner to carry on business at the building after the century turnover the way it had prior to that time, and maintenance costs are expenses. Where there's a significant upgrade incorporated with Y2K maintenance, you can expect the landlord to argue that notwithstanding that capital costs may not properly be included in operating costs, the particular cost at issue will fall into one of the usual exceptions in a lease where the result is to reduce energy use, 
or otherwise bring efficiencies to the operation of the building, such as perhaps by decreasing the number of staff required. The resolution to this issue will lie in the lease, if the, if the relationship is an existing one. If it's a new one, we're back to that story of bargaining power again and whether or not you can negotiate something outside the landlord's standard form. If a tenant isn't Y2K compliant and it can't pay its rent, the landlord will have all the usual remedies that would have, which I think have been more than adequately addressed here today and will continue to be if I can. On the other hand, if the building isn't operative on January 1, the tenant will need to ask two questions. Is this a result of the failure to fix a Y2K issue which was under or within the control of the landlord? Or is this the result of an occurrence outside the control of the landlord? In the first instance, illustrated by elevators which are grounded because the landlord missed replacing a Y2K sensitive chip, your client has offices on the 42nd floor which are obviously inaccessible, the tenant would likely have a claim for breach of the landlord's covenant for quiet enjoyment. In the second instance, have a look at the lease. There's probably a very strong exculpatory clause in favor of the landlord, but that's where you'll find the answer. I just want to quickly mention one key issue in uh, the matter of breach for quiet enjoyment. It could result in a suspension of rent until the breach is cured and damages, including those for lost profits, but be careful with the issue of suspension of rent. Should a tenant withhold rent, it provides the landlord with an immediate excuse to terminate the lease putting the tenant in position of having to seek a, an order for relief from forfeiture. That means the tenant could be shut for a day or two or three while they go to court. It could cost them some money. They may or may not win. You know, it's an uncertain position to be in. Even if the landlord doesn't terminate the lease, if the tenant has withheld the rent and the court doesn't agree that there was a breach of a covenant for quiet enjoyment, it will order the tenant to pay all of the arrears. So rather than consider suspension of rent as your remedy, I would encourage you to think of a court-ordered abatement for a period equal to the period during which the breach continued as the most appropriate approach. All I can say is I hope Y2K is nothing but a big yawn. <laughs> Devin, does the Oxford lease have any reference to Y2K issues? Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Peter Milligan of Poole Milligan. And uh, Peter will speak about integrating property tax reform and the lease how to draft the lease to protect yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, earlier today, you heard uh, from Phil Sanford, uh, uh, a friend and colleague uh, in the property tax field, about the significant changes that have occurred uh, to the property tax regime in Ontario. And uh, I, from looking at uh, Phil's paper, I understand that he at least touched upon the, uh, the rights of appeal that now exist uh, in Ontario with, uh, as far as the landlord and tenant are concerned. And I will also touch on that from the point of view of the drafting exercise. Uh, in the brief time that I have, uh, and I can tell you uh, uh, six minutes, we can hardly touch upon some of the issues that I think you're going to need to be concerned about if you're going to do a, an appropriate job for either a landlord or tenant. I would like to focus on a couple of things. First of all, you all are aware that there have been significant changes to the property tax system. We no longer have a business tax. Uh, tenants no longer receive individual notices of property assessment. Uh, those notices were solely for purposes of creating the business tax regime, and that is gone. So there is only now one notice of property uh, valuation or assessment that goes out. It goes out to the landlord. Uh, as I've indicated in my paper, the, uh, this, these systemic changes to the property tax system created significant problems for depending on the type of lease that you were dealing with. And those of you who are advising on a regular basis uh, small tenants who might be involved in existing gross leases should uh, uh, look at my paper and read uh, the section that deals with gross leases. Uh, there was, unless the government, the government in effect has legislatively intervened in the contractual process in order to ensure that there, there was not an outburst of litigation such as that in New Brunswick several years ago when they uh, abolished their pro uh, business tax regime. Under a gross lease, as you all know, uh, there is a fixed amount of rent which includes all costs and all tax, would include the realty tax. With the abolition of the business tax, uh, the, it doesn't mean that someone is paying less tax, it merely means we now have one form of tax, which is a realty tax. And under the existing gross leases that some of you may have to deal with, uh, the landlord would have been obligated, arguably, uh, to, uh, to pay that, which would have been uh, quite, uh, quite disastrous and uh, would have 
resulted in significant litigation. The government has intervened. Uh, I've put in my paper uh, the, uh, the provisions of the Municipal Act under Part 22, uh, 441 and 442.2. Uh, there are notices that must be given by landlords. First of all, a notice of intent to require payment and notice requiring payment. And uh, you should uh, familiarize yourself with those provisions. You should also familiarize yourself completely with 20, uh, Part 22.1. Uh, Phil Sanford probably referred earlier today to the hard caps and, fa uh, and uh, clawbacks, which uh, are now in place right across Ontario. In Toronto, we have the 2.4% hard cap on increases and a clawback to feed those, uh, uh, those caps. And similarly, in the balance of Ontario, we have a hard cap of 10% for 1998 on increases, 5% in 1999, and 5% in 2000, which are all going to be fed by a clawback. Uh, some of your clients will probably be calling and uh, screaming at you through the phone about having received revised 1998 tax bills, which indicate that uh, they're going to pay if they were going to get a big reduction in 1998 because of the property tax reform, they now see that there is a, a clawback. In the case I just dealt yesterday with a large uh, commercial property in Hamilton, Hamilton has recently issued its notices, and the clawback, I am advised, is approximately 57 percent. And of course, that taxpayer had not budgeted for that, and uh, that has created some significant consternation. So you need to familiarize yourself completely with uh, Part 22.1. I'm not going to go into the detail, uh, but you need to know how that is going to work because there will be disputes between landlords and tenants as landlords try to pass through in the net lease environment and, for that matter, in the gross lease environment, those clawbacks. Uh, and also in the case of, of where there may have been an overcharge now because of uh, because of a, uh, a significant increase in tax, the hard caps in place will provide some, uh, some assistance to that landlord, and the tenant should be aware of that to ensure that they're paying the appropriate amount. The balance of the time that I have, I'd like to simply just address the issue of apportionment. Uh, this is something that uh, all of you who deal with commercial leases and multi-tenanted properties will have to uh, uh, familiarize yourself with. Uh, under, the, uh, under the old uh, uh, scenario where we had individual notices of assessment, uh, the, the apportionment issue could be directed to the, uh, to the assessor's apportionment. Uh, there, as I said in my paper, there's about as many ways to apportion taxes in, uh, in multi-tenanted properties as your imagination can let you, uh, let you create. However, some of the most familiar ones are gross leasable area, GLA, uh, 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 occupancy of a, of a particular demised area over total building. Uh, others uh, deal with uh, use of some form of fair market rent, which is usually what I call the assessor's methodology. Uh, existing leases, shopping center leases, commercial leases will direct, them, direct themselves to, in some instances, to this type of methodology. You'll see uh, wording to the effect that if there is a separate assessment of the property, then regard will be had to that for purposes of apportioning tax burden. Uh, the reason why I've referred you to 22.1 is because with the eradication of the business assessment, there are p potentials for shortfalls on the part of the, of the landlord, and he can pass those through to the tenants, notwithstanding what would otherwise be uh, exigible under the lease. So, but to come back to the apportionment issue, uh, you have to be extremely careful now in, uh, in uh, drafting fresh leases or dealing with the, uh, even dealing with the existing uh, wording of leases. Uh, because there's going to be uh, some disputes, I am quite sure, over what constitutes a separate assessment. As I've indicated in my paper in Ontario, although the assessors, uh, although the uh, Ontario Property Assessment Corporation, OPAC, is, not, is no longer issuing notices of separate assess, uh, property assessment to the tenants, there are working papers of the assessors. So if you look at a shopping center, the assessor will work out a, 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 a rental analysis that gives rise to a total amount of net operating income uh, based on fair market rents, which he will then capitalize to an estimate of value. That one value, uh, the landlord might say, it, well, I do, there is no separate assessment of the individual tenant's uh, uh, demised area. However, uh, a tenant's uh, uh, representative could go to the assessing authority, or the landlord's uh, representative could do the same thing and seek the working papers, which would indicate how the assessor had got to that individual tenant's uh, fair market rent for instance, for, say, a shopper's drug mart or for a, uh, a dialects type store or for a department store. And on that basis, there may, be, there, will, there, there may be information available to you to assist in actually apportioning the uh, tax burden, ensuring your, your client is either paying their fair share or is seeking to be paid their fair share. Uh, 
And that becomes important because there will be disputes under existing leases as to whether or not that working paper or document constitutes a separate assessment within the meaning of the, uh, uh, of the contract uh, or the lease. So I, uh, I, I wanted to, uh, and I think that'll be a debate, and I think uh, you're going to find yourselves involved. There is a right of information uh, uh, under the Assessment Act for uh, the tenants uh, can avail themselves of, and I've mentioned that on page four. Uh, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the uh, right to challenge assessments, given that the, uh, uh, there is only one assessment of property, it will be more difficult for tenants uh, to uh, engage in litigation over the valuation uh, of the property. However, there is a right of appeal. Uh, we refer to it as the stranger appeal. Uh, a tenant may appeal uh, the total assessment of the property, must give notice. Uh, please uh, go to the Assessment Act and look at the uh, appeal provisions. Give notice to the owner of the property uh, that is being appealed, uh, that it, but there is still the right of appeal. One of the things I would suggest to you in, uh, in certainly dealing with uh, any fresh leases or a renegotiation of leases, that if you are representing a tenant who you believe would want to exercise that right at some point, be sure to uh, uh, draft it in such a manner uh, that, there is, that the landlord is required to provide reasonable cooperation. You have to remember that landlords basically operate on a revenue neutral basis. They look to apportion taxes amongst all the tenants so that they can pay the bill. Uh, they're not terribly inter interested in litigating over the value of the property. They're just interested in making sure they can pay the bill. So tenants tend to be more interested in uh, ensuring that they're paying their fair share, no more, no less. And therefore, on that basis, you want to be sure that your tenant can access the necessary information to conduct an appeal. Thanks very much. Let me just uh, open it up for one question only. Yes. Well, there's, there's going to be some litigation around that. That is not clear. And if you look at uh, Part 22.1, that is far from clear. Uh, certainly, uh, tenants, uh, and I can think that, for instance, anchor tenants, who uh, are large department stores, who might have received a significant reduction uh, had they been on, their, on a separate roll number, you know, but for the cap, uh, may inf ironically find themselves actually getting an increase. So there's going to be litigation there. Uh, the, what the cap does, what the capping uh, legislation does, is protects the overall tax burden of the property. The apportionment of that tax burden is going to become a matter of discussion and perhaps dispute between the landlord and his individual tenants. Uh, so take a look at 22.1. You've raised a very good question because I think that's an area that will be litigated uh, at a commercial level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ken Beeler is our next speaker of Dow Vukovic, Baker Siegel Banka, and uh, Ken's paper is available. It's hot off the presses and available to you as you walk out of this room. Ken will address defaults, a practical view of landlord and tenant remedies. Actually, we're going to narrow it down, and uh, I'm going to skip landlord's remedies, as Monty called me last week and wondered why I was doing his topic as well. Um, so I'm going to stick to uh, as much as I can cover in six minutes on tenants' remedies. A client said to me this morning, he was surprised that I could talk to you all about all of tenants' remedies in six minutes, and said he'd give me the benefit of doubt on the next bill. If I bill him anything over 12 minutes, he'd be disappointed. Uh, I'm going to deal, I guess, in one, two, and two things. I'm going to touch on basically uh, fundamental breach, and I want to deal with one practical aspect of remedies and that's been coming up in my practice recently, and that's where tenants are getting leasehold uh, allowances, uh, leasehold inducements, and uh, cash allowances, things of that nature, especially uh, restaurant tenants, uh, franchisees, franchisors who are building their own premises. The thing to be very concerned about there is your ability to recover that inducement, your cash allowance. Uh, without getting back into the Goodyear case, you can see the key element is you've got to worry about is, are you ever going to recover that? A lot of the times you'll enter into the lease, it could be a year in advance uh, of the time when you're actually going to get under construction. It could be six or eight months, depending on the permit process. You don't know what the position of the landlord is going to be down the road when it actually comes time to collecting that. So if you're unable to negotiate for a letter of credit or some form of security in the lease, uh, 
you then have to look to the lease itself when you're negotiating it to see what type of remedy that you can negotiate. Otherwise, you're gonna be stuck down the road. For example, a lot of the times we'll try and negotiate a right of set off. Now, you've probably heard today that landlords hate rights of set off. They all cry they can't have any rights of set off in the lease. The mortgagees will not accept it. However, if you're receiving a substantial inducement to build a building or to do some heavy construction, if you're investing a quarter of a million dollars, sometimes a million dollars in the landlord's premises, you better stick to your guns and make sure you get that right. The other thing that you're going to have to look for and should be a condition of your deal is to get a non-disturbance agreement from any lender who's in priority to your lease because without that, if that lender steps in, you may be flat out of luck in trying to recover that. One, they would have the right to terminate your lease. Secondly, they could ar argue that if there was no non-disturbance agreement, they never bargained for that. They never agreed to pay you the money. And subject to your argument uh, for unjust enrichment, you may not be able to recover that money other than from the landlord who at that point in time is probably insolvent. So uh, be careful. The key, the, most of the tenant's remedies are often dealt with right in the inception of the negotiation of the lease. There are statutory remedies, but I'm sure as you're all aware that when you get the landlord's form of lease, you've basically been told you've now waived everything so you have no rights. When you're doing the lease, the most important thing is to consider your remedies at the beginning. Don't look to the end when the problem's going to arise because you may not have any remedies at that time. Uh, that gets me basically, uh, one other thing I just wanted to touch on is uh, an issue that came up a couple weeks ago and that is overpayment of rents where the landlord has sold the shopping center. Now for your tenants who are out there who may determine somewhere down the road that they have overpaid whether it be additional rent or minimum rent or there's been some problem, they're going to find that when that plaza has been sold, there is no recourse to the new landlord. They're going to go have to go back against the original landlord who they had the original covenant with. And at that point in time, there may or may not be any assets available for them to recover. And if they don't have a right of set off in the lease, they're going to be out of luck. That gets to the issue of fundamental breach. I've often told clients who come in, they say, well, look, we've waived this right and we've waived that right, and do we have any rights? And as you know, though it seems to be the last ditch effort these days is to turn around and say, well, regardless of all the rights I've waived, you landlord are in fundamental breach of my lease, and that not only gives me a right to damages, but I can now walk from the lease. And basically, it's a contractual principle that's been enunciated uh, that started off in the Kelly Douglas case, it is now being further uh, drawn through the system where we're using contractual principles in, in, uh, in leases as opposed to the real property principles that used to be applicable. Uh, examples of what a fundamental breach has been determined to be would be a failure of one party to perform an obligation which has the effect of depriving the other party of substantially the whole benefit of the contract, or a breach which goes to the root of the contract a breach which undermines the party's intentions under the whole of the contract. So the question then gets down to what did the parties intend, what did the parties expect when they entered into the lease? Those are the things that the courts will look at. Now let me give you some examples of uh, cases where tenants have successfully been able to say, you the landlord have, are in fundamental breach of my lease, thank you very much, I'm leaving. In the Lendorf case was a uh, law firm situation where the tenant was a law firm and uh, there was no covenant in the lease that it had to continue to operate from the premises. It chose to uh, move on to bigger and better premises when the markets got better, it got better space, a better deal, and it then attempted to assign the premises. The landlord said, we're not going to consent for whatever reasons. That's it, okay. Let me just uh, give you a couple. That's the situation there. The court actually in that case turned around and said, no, you're depriving the uh, tenant of the value of its lease, and that was a fundamental breach, and accordingly the tenant was able to walk from the balance of the two years left on the lease. Another case uh, also involving a law firm was ad hoc management versus prudential, and that's where the tenant had a right to lease adjoining space. The uh, facts of it were the partners wouldn't have signed the lease without that right to lease the adjoining space. The landlord went out and leased the space, the tenant said, well, you can't tell me when I can get that space. You can't give it to me. I'm leaving. We're off the hook. Thank you. The court said that was exactly right. It was a fundamental provision of the lease, and accordingly, there was a fundamental breach allowing the tenant to walk. And just to give you how far you can actually stretch this, there's a factual situation that we came across where a tenant turned around and said, you know, it was in a building where, you know, they're 
typical offices, uh, you know, high profile tenants. After a while, the landlord started leasing some of the offices out to some government agencies, et cetera. The tenant came around and said, you know what, you fundamentally breached my lease. When I entered into this, this was a first class building. It had first class tenants and first class patrons. But now guess what, landlord? Now we've got people hanging out in the lobby. There's bicycle carriers. There's all sorts of people down there waiting. And you know what? It's no longer a first class building. That's a fundamental breach of my lease and we're gone. Now the case was settled, but there's an example of how you can turn around and try and use that to your advantage, regardless of whatever rights are available to to you in your lease. In a nutshell. Thank you very much. Any questions? One question? Yes. say they're encroaching into a space. Yeah, can you just summarize that very quickly? The fact? Well, I think you're saying you've got a client who's got, there's no wall. There's no wall between his space and the front of the building, the industrial space. Right. And putting a wall and doing construction for the tenant that's going to occupy the front of the right. space. But the, build, the people that are using the building and what have you basically essentially have to encroach into the space. Okay, it's, they say what is, you've got a situation with where a lot of leases cover it, where the land, and you may have to look at the lease, whether or not the landlord has reserved the right to encroach to enter upon the premises in order con to construct demising walls. Uh, a lot of the times you'll see uh, a clause in the lease that allows the landlord the right to come in and interfere and to even excavate in things in order to carry out additional work. You've got to look at the, f uh, first of all, look to the lease and see if the landlord has already reserved that right. If it's exercising that right reasonably, your client is probably stuck. Uh, if, if on the facts it's not being reasonable, it doesn't have the right to do that, look to see if there's a clause that doesn't permit the landlord to do alterations without the tenant's consent, is access uh, being denied, and more important thing, is your client really <laughs> suffering any damages? Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. And don't forget to pick up Ken's paper. Our next speaker is Corey Sherman of Sherman Associates. And uh, Corey is our last speaker, and he will be addressing uh, lease documentation in the 21st century, amending your lease for the new millennium. So I don't know if you're like me, but I think there's just been such a massive, actually, there were a couple of people I saw whose heads were starting to smoke in the back. <laughs> so I think they've chosen me for the last topic because this is fluff. You don't have to <laughs> think about it. No case law. I'm just going to throw out some thoughts. Um, has anyone here read the, the uh, bestseller, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? You ever read that book? Wow, no one. Um, <laughs> you should Was read it. Good? <laughs> Go to Chapters or Indigo and pick it up and, and, and read it. W one of the thoughts is it, it talks about how we schedule our time. And if you're like me, um, your desk is covered with urgent matters. Um, some of them are important, some of them are not important, but you're returning the call from the person who's, who's calling you, bugging you. These are the urgent matters. You're controlled by other people's whims. There's this other category up here of things that are really important but non-urgent. Um, that's where this, this kind of stuff comes in. Uh, I'm sure you could think of lots of things on that list. They just get shoved aside. We never get to them. Um, this is one of them. Um, as I say at the beginning of my paper, as we approach the end of this millennium, we should be reminded that at least once every thousand years, lease documentation and building management practices should be reviewed and updated. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of our developers uh, and, and tenants who have their own lease forms have done that, have, have taken those steps uh, over the last uh, year or two. And, and updated their lease forms. But it, it's amazing to me how many have, and I would suggest the vast majority of developers and, and tenants have not. Um, what, what they have done over the last 10 or 20 years is they've taken clauses, they've added in the words capital taxes when capital taxes came in, and they've added in a few other things um, to deal with, with situations. But they haven't kind of stepped back uh, and looked at the whole package, and, and I'm suggesting that's what we should do. We should take the time as we approach the end of the millennium, take our lease forms and modify them. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly on three topics. Updating the lease form for the new millennium, 
building management practices and simplifying negotiations. Um, if any of you have been involved in transactions, large transactions in the, the last little while, um, purchases or sales of or financings of large portfolios, um, th there are two categories of assets that shopping center or any other commercial owners have. One is the bricks and mortar, uh, the buildings, the HVAC systems. The other, and I would suggest the, that when the bean counters value properties, what they look at is they look at the leases. How, many, uh, how much are the tenants paying per square foot? And then are we discounting them because they have bad clauses? because the landlords failed to update their forms because termination rights were negotiated, et cetera. So um, I would suggest to you that this kind of stuff is very, very important. Um, make sure that your lease forms are tight and they're, um, they're up to date. Um, updating the lease form for the new millennium, um, I would suggest again an overall review and cleanup of your lease documentation, as I mentioned earlier. Simplify it, modernize it. Um, most leases uh, that we negotiate now, many of them, I, I would say, go 20, 30 years into the future. Um, looks, look what's happened just in the last two or three years with the advent of email and the internet, just those, those couple of things alone. So look forward, uh, where are we going, and keep that in mind, where are we today, where are we going, when you, uh, when you update your, your lease form. Um, Peter mentioned amendments required to deal with the, uh, the reality of the new tax regime. It's, Amazing that, again, most lease forms still have those classic clauses suggesting that they're separate assessments, a whole long clause dealing with separate assessments. If there are no separate assessments, then we'll, we'll do it on a proportionate share basis. I was actually in a meeting last week with Peter, and uh, he, he said a couple things. He, well, the, he said, first of all, I do not believe, I would virtually guarantee that we will not see business taxes in Ontario for the balance of any of our lifetimes. Uh, it just will not happen. And that's his perspective as a political animal, being involved in the process of what's gone on in the last couple of years. Um, I'm not saying that we should take everything out of our leases dealing with business taxes, but maybe took a, take a look at the wording. And if you've got a clause dealing with business taxes that's a page long, maybe it should be cut down with, to a couple of lines. Um, Reporting of gross revenue electronically, uh, list of records, uh, definitions of gross revenue, all those things. Um, uh, a couple years ago, I, I was asked a question, I was giving a little speech and asked a question about internet shopping and, and thought, well, it's, all the statistics show it's going to be maybe two or three percent of sales and we don't have to worry too much about it. Uh, things have changed dramatically over the last couple of years. I would suggest that our kids will probably do more than half of their shopping on the internet. So as a shopping center owner, you better look at these issues very carefully. Um, as, a, as a shopping center owner, I would want to ensure that I uh, get all of the gross revenue reports electronically. I will uh, put in clauses, uh, I've, I've got some sample clauses here, I won't read them now, but take a look at them, just some ideas. Um, I'd like to have, have an assurance from all my tenants that they will spend the few hundred dollars that's required to make sure their computers are compatible so that, oh boy, so that I can get, uh, I can get all my reports done um, uh, electronically uh, and directly. Uh, make sure that you're covering off internet sales. Make sure that if someone buys something at home on their computer and comes to the store at Bayview Village to pick it up, well, you should make sure you include those, uh, those revenues. Maybe they're paying for it at the store as well. They just ordered it on the internet. Um, another idea, tenant obligated to participate in e-commerce program developed by landlord, including development of program, advertising of shopping center web page, and full participation in e-commerce program. Um, I've seen, uh, I think it's Cambridge, uh, out in Oakville, has the Oakville Place or Oakville Mall has its own web page, which I think is a brilliant idea. Instead of letting Amazon and the rest of, of the internet crowd steal all your sales, develop your own web page so all of your tenants can take advantage. You can have your own shopping center and they can get the internet sales and the, uh, the sales on site. Um, building management, I'll leave uh, for you to read. I, I know everyone's in a hurry to get up. Simplifying negotiations, I'll just leave you with some thoughts. Um, the obvious ones, creative compromises, try to learn the compromise positions, don't just say no, uh, we're all in this together so let's try to compromise and come up with the compromise positions. Monty mentioned 
uh, a particular case, sorry, a particular clause about um, uh, rent going up by 10% if certain um, uh, tenants or, or uh, uh, large tenants were added. If you look at the very last page of my materials, paragraph 7, that's a, that's a clause from one of our Canadian landlord's lease and it's crossed out. The reason it's crossed out is, is I'm suggesting that you should cross that clause out. It's the same clause that Monty referred to. Um, it, it's hidden in Article 4 somewhere and it says, if any, uh, if, if we get a few more large tenants, your rent goes up by 10% for each of those large tenants. Don't sneak snuff like that in. Make sure that if you want to deal with that issue, deal with it right up front. Uh, last point. Review your five most unfair or highly negotiated clauses and modify them to reflect a more equitable position. If you're a landlord, you know what they are. Every single tenant, whether they be 20,000 feet or 1,000 feet, ask for them to be modified, and you always agree to modify them, so why don't you do it right up front? That's it. Thank you very much, and I want to thank all of the speakers today. They did a terrific job, and thank all of the registrants for being uh, so attentive, and I think the program was terrific. I hope you all enjoyed it. And don't forget your uh, evaluations. Bye-bye.